I wonder if you could tell me who do you know in your life that will never become a Christian? We always talk about seeing people saved, but who do you know in maybe the world situation or in your particular life and you say, that person will never become a Christian? If they're close to you, do you pray for them? Do you ask God to open their eyes? Or have you completely written them off? And say, well, it's impossible. They'll never get saved. Two young guys were talking one day, and one of them said to the other, you know, of all the people I know, you are the one guy I knew God couldn't save. And God did save both of them. They actually went to the mission field together so God could do this wonderful thing. Pastor Alex has been talking to us about his disciples. They had all their hopes in Jesus. Then Jesus comes to the cross and he dies and all their hopes are crushed. And then the resurrection and all of their dreams are soon realized that God is doing something wonderful, which they didn't understand. And uh, our situation is totally different. We didn't come up to the cross in the older days and say, oh, uh, I'm changed because of the cross, because that's behind us. But... Um, we are on the other side of the cross. We look back to the cross to see what it is that God is doing. We're going to look at a man who nobody would have thought would become a Christian. Um, his name is Paul in the Bible. He wrote much of the New Testament, but people wrote him off. He could never become a Christian. Now, you wonder, this man was very studious. He studied under the best, and he made up his mind. He looked at Jesus Christ, and he looked at that cross. And he said, people said he was the Messiah, the Christ to come, the one that, th that would do so many wonderful things in the whole country of Judea. In fact, to the world... But that cross stood in Paul's way. And in the Old Testament, it says, as cursed is everyone who hangs on the cross. Cursed they are. So he looked and he strained with all his might and he said, that's impossible. The Messiah who is coming to raise up Israel, he could never go to the cross. And so he violently opposed Jesus and everything about us. Oh, how different that is for you and me. <laughs> because we look at the cross and say, that's where I'm included when God has saved me. Paul says, no, exclude him, but we are included by the cross of Jesus Christ. If you have your Bibles... In the book of Acts, in chapter 22, Paul gives his testimony. His testimony is the same, it's not the same, the same, they're not the same. And in chapter 22, we have this incident, at the end of chapter 21, uh, Paul comes back to Jerusalem, and his part is for the nation of Israel. And he wants them to understand the truth of God. Chapter 9 tells how he was saved. In chapter 22, he's given permission to speak to this riot, this mob, that were trying to kill him. As you know, Eleanor leads a group on Saturdays. And one of the things one of the ladies said, this is, she's in Ukraine. She said, one of the things that you taught us is to pray for our enemies. And here was Paul, passionate about teaching his own people. And he said, I, I'm going to tell them. 
And so he recounts. They, they don't understand this. They try to beat him up. And the Romans pick him up and they take him in. And just before he's taken into this barracks to be whipped to find out what's going on, he says, can I speak to the crowd? And miracle of miracles, the, the commanding officer said, yes, you can, you can. And he motioned with his hands and says, quiet, 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 I want to say something to you. And when he heard them, or when, he, when they heard him speaking in Aramaic, the cultural language, they became very quiet. Just like you, allowing me to speak to you right now. You're not saying anything. Don't, don't get, uh, just leave it. And he gives his testimony. Brothers and fathers, listen to my, to my defense. When you heard him speak in Aramaic, they became very quiet. And Paul said, I am a Jew born in Tarsus of Cilicia, but brought up in this city under Gamaliel. I was thoroughly trained in the law of our fathers and was just as zealous for God as any of you are today. I persecuted the followers of this way to their death, arresting both men and women and throwing them into prison, as also the high priest and all the council can testify. I even obtained letters from them to their brothers in Damascus and went there to bring these people as prisoners to Jerusalem to be punished. About noon, as I came near Damascus, suddenly a bright light found from heaven flashed around me. I fell to the ground, and I heard a voice say to me, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? Who are you, Lord, I asked. I am Jesus of Nazareth, whom you are persecuting. And Paul said, uh-oh. <laughs> That's in the margin, in case you're wondering. My companions saw the light, but they did not understand the voice of him who was speaking to me. What shall I do, Lord, I asked. Get up and go into Damascus. There you will be told that what that has been assigned to you. My companions led me by the hand into Damascus. <clears throat> Excuse me. Because of the brilliance of the light had blinded me. A man named Ananias came to see me. He was a devout observer of the law and highly respected by all the Jews living there. He stood beside me and said, Brother Saul, receive your sight. And at that very moment I was able to see. Then he said, The God of our fathers has chosen you to know his will and to see the righteous one and to hear his words from his mouth. You will be his witness to all men of what can be seen and heard. And now... What are you waiting for? Get up, be baptized, wash away your sins, calling on his name. When I returned to Jerusalem and was praying in the temple, I fell into a trance and saw the Lord speaking. Quick, he said, leave Jerusalem immediately because they will not accept your testimony about me. Lord, I replied, these men know that I went from one synagogue to another to imprison and beat those who believe in you. And when the blood of your martyr, Stephen, was shed, I, I stood there giving my approval and guarding the clothes of those who were killing him. Then the Lord said to me, Go, I will send you far away to the Gentiles. <laughs> and they listened up to that point, and then the riot started again. They didn't want to hear that, that God was sending somebody from their group out to the Gentiles because then the Gentiles would come to believe in God as they did, and they didn't want that. And so the riot ensued again. And Paul tells us what a testimony is. Here is what happened before. This is what happened that day when and since that time. This is what is happening in my life. Paul says in the before time, I murdered people. In verse 19, Lord, these men know that I went in from one synagogue to another to imprison and beat those who believe in you. He would go there, beat them up, put them in some kind of cage, and take them back to Jerusalem. And they would be killed because they would not 
denounced Jesus. They knew this. And in verse 4, he admits that I persecuted the followers of this way to their death, arresting both men and women and throwing them into prison. I was a ringleader. In the Second World War, there was a group, the Nazis, who took the Jewish people. They itemized them, put them into boxcars, took them to places, and exterminated them. Paul went to other cities gathered up all those who were believers in God, brought them back to Jerusalem, and did just the same thing. I'm sure there are many people who said, he could never get saved. God could never do anything in his life. But somebody prayed. Somebody prayed. Now there's the before time and the when. This is what happened. Verse 6, it says that he was walking along and all of a sudden God came to him as he does to all of us. And he asked him the question, why are you persecuting me? Oh, no, I'm just knocking off a bunch of your followers. No, 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 no. When we touch God's people, we touch the heart of God. You are very intimate with God. God loves you so much. You want to touch a parent? Touch their child. If you're cross to them, you get the parent's anger. But if you're loving and kind to that child, you touch the parent's heart. And God is touched by every one of his people. They're not forgotten. You are not forgotten. Never. Your heart is linked eternally with Almighty God. No one expected Paul to get saved. In fact, if you go back to chapter 9, Paul said, or God said to, to uh, Ananias, go there and talk to him. And he says, God, do you know who that man is? <laughs> as if God didn't know. He said, you know that man? He's going to take some of us people back to Jerusalem. No, no. I want him. He's going to be my messenger of truth. None. But what happened? God had specific jobs in mind for Paul to do. He was available. He never said, okay, I'm, I'm saved now, therefore I can just go off and do my own business. God said, no, no, absolutely not. I have a work for you to do. And when God saves any one of us, he says, there are certain things that I want you to be involved in. Are you available? Hmm. The Spirit works within us right away. Verse 15, it states this. You will be his witness to all men of what you have seen and heard. You will bear the testimony of God in your heart. In verse 21, he says, this is your job. You're going away to the Gentiles. The Jews won't listen. You, you take a man like Moses in the Old Testament and Isaiah in the Old Testament and Jeremiah and some of the minor prophets, Ezekiel, and they were told, this is your message. Give this message out to the people. And in Isaiah chapter 6, it, uh, it just floors me. You, you've seen God, Isaiah. Here's your message to the nation and they won't believe you. They won't be changed from their way of life. What a crushing thing to hear. <laughs> to climb the ladder of success in your particular business, get to the very top and find out the ladder's on the wrong building. <laughs> You've wasted your life. But that's what God called this man to do. They won't listen, but you still tell them. The witness. 
who's that person in your life or you know they'll never get saved? Are you praying for them? Are you saying, God, I, I pray, God, because you're the only one who can open their eyes and put the Spirit of God in them. You're the only one, and that is the truth. And here's the testimony. Here was the incident in chapter 9, and then in chapter 22, he speaks to the, the Jewish people, and then in chapter 26, he speaks to the Romans. And it's the same testimony, but it's not the same. It's the same testimony, but not the same, because he tailors it to who is sitting in front of him. And uh, that was good. And that's what we are called to do as well to give our testimony to those around us, to speak the word of truth to the people in our life, give our testimony as Paul was called to do. <laughs> now I know that you're sitting there and your palms are getting a little sweaty and you're a little nervous and say, oh, do I have to go out of here and witness? <laughs> do I have to tell people about Jesus? Do I have to be one who <coughs> goes and asks my friends that don't believe in God? you got to believe in him. It's just the truth. But there's a little bit of panic. Let me give you some relief, shall we? I don't want you to evade the situation of being a Christian and evade giving a testimony. I don't want you to do that. I want to give you some relief, though. Take a, everybody take a breath. In, out. One more time. Good. Are you relieved? <laughs> I hope so. I hope so. At the beginning of this book, Jesus is just ready to go back into heaven, and he says to his disciples, you will be my witnesses. You'll be my witnesses. Before you ever do anything, you'll be a witness. Two psychologists said this, people should think less about what they ought to do and more about what they ought to be. If only their being were good, their works would shine forth brightly. And what do you have to pass on? To speak as to what God is doing in your life today, in the past week, I had this message all put together about Wednesday, and I had it, and I thought, oh, this is good stuff. And since that time, I have taken some stuff out and put some stuff in. Why? Because I was mulling it over and wanting it to be changing my life as well as presenting something fresh to you. So sometimes when you get and you want a testimony, Preparing is very important. What happened to you before? What kind of life did you live before? When did this happen, this coming with Christ? And then uh, what's happened since? Since. Because that's all vital. Beforehand. What was your life like beforehand? Before you had invited Jesus into your life? Be brief about that. We don't need to hear about all your sins. We don't near need to hear about all those awful things that you were involved in. When I was at Bible college, you get to know a few guys very closely as you study together and read together and go to classes together. One of the fellows that was there taking this Bible course along with me, <clears throat> he was an American. <laughs> it's okay. No. <laughs> Nothing. Let me continue. He was in the American Navy, shall we say. He was a sailor in the American Navy. <laughs> he was so disgusting that he and his friends were so bad that the other sailors said, you are gross one and gross two. They did things that were so disgusting 
The other sailors named them Gross One and Gross Two, and my friend was Gross Two. I said, well, what on earth did you do? They said, no, I don't want to talk about it. I don't want to talk about it. And <laughs> we don't need to talk about it. If, if you touch base with somebody, I went through that situation as well. Okay, that's fine. But, but God is saying to us, listen, that's where you were. That's not where you are. Leave it in the past. So make your testimony when you, and you can write it out, just a few words, but don't stick it on your phone or don't put it in a piece of paper and say, well, I remember when I was saved. I got this. People get bored with that. What's happening in your life right now? Be alive with your faith. That's the before. What about the when? What surprised you about Jesus coming into your life? A fellow was telling us that he was in a hospital bed and uh, he had a friend come and they talked and this friend was a Christian and led this man to Christ. He was in a hospital bed. He couldn't <laughs> sort of get up and walk out. He had to listen to it. But anyway, he turned his life over to Jesus. He said, God, I want you to come into my life. And so the man said, very good, and he got saved, and then the friend went home. And so the man in the bed had a very peaceful night. So the next morning he woke up and he thought, wow, this is really something different. And so he reached over to the shelf next to him to pick up a package of cigarettes. This one you could smoke in the hospital. Remember those days? Maybe you're too young. Anyway. He, could actually, he picked it up, and he put a cigarette in his mouth, he went to reach for the lighter, and it dropped on the floor, and he began to curse. And he just got the first phrase out, and he couldn't finish it. <laughs> because God has already started to change him, especially in his mouth. Not the smoking, the cursing. And he said, I was so amazed. I was so amazed. What happened to you? That's your testimony. What happened to you? How has God changed you? And oh, oh, what's happened since that time? Your testimony is not dull, dry, and boring. Your testimony is alive. It's exciting. What would happen if we said, when the church gets back together and said, we're going to have a testimony meeting to tell what God has done for you. And a little boy comes up and says, for God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. And I've asked Jesus to come into my life. And he goes and sits down. And everybody says, oh, that's wonderful. And there's an old guy at the back or maybe the front. And he's thinking to himself, Doggone it, that was my verse. Have at least two verses, okay? <laughs> it, it's John 3, 6, we got that. What else? What is God doing in your life now? Because, you see, your testimony is there. So we'll go out and we'll talk about our jobs. We'll talk about the situation we find ourselves. We'll talk about the hockey game. No, we won't talk about the hockey game. But anyway, that's fine. We'll talk about what really interests us, what, what motivates us. Does Christ motivate us? Is he exciting us? Are we setting aside time daily to talk with him, to read his word, to find out what is, is going on in his heart so he gives it to us? Are we available? Are we available? And do we pray? Because we have this spiritual life within us, have we prayed for those people who will never get saved? They're not wasted. They're collected and presented as incense before God. Since that time, I told you, I, relief. I'm not causing you to evade it. But preparing your testimony, having it in your mind, this happened before, this has happened when, this has happened since, and I'm growing, I'm continuing. That's where God wants us to be. A pastor was 
giving a message and he said, don't forget this. In Romans chapter 3, it states this. There is no one who seeks after God. No, not one. There is nobody who makes up his or her mind to come to Jesus. Nobody. That's what the scriptures say. That's in the Old Testament and that's in the New Testament. Nobody. And the pastor went on to say, listen, if somebody comes to you and starts asking you about God and spiritual matters, then you go with them. Because in John chapter 6 it says, no one can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws him and I will raise him up at the last day. No one can come to me unless the Father is working in that person's life and drawing that person to God. And when you find somebody like that, put aside everything and become very interested in telling that person your testimony, your spiritual truth. And so what happened? Midweek, a girl came back and said, she was at university, and she said, you know, I was just in uh, going to class, and this girl said, you know, I think you're a Christian. And there's 12 girls in our dorm who are studying the Bible, and none of us know anything about the Bible. Could you tell us what's there? So this girl said, yes, and she said, I'll, I'll cancel my class. I went to the uh, cafeteria with this other girl and talked to her about Jesus. Why? Because God had took that girl's heart and was drawing it to himself. And there was a girl who was available. And since her life was changing, she was able to present the gospel to this girl. At that particular university, they had tried to get Bible studies started. After this incident, they began three Bible studies in the women's dorm and two in the men's dorm, whereas before they couldn't do it. The right time, the right time, and they were ready. Your testimony, valuable. What is God before? When did it happen? How did it happen? And since that time, are we all growing in Christ? Are we all saying to God, I, I want to change. I want to become more like you. I'm here excited about being your people. Are, are you not saved? But you have something in the back of your mind, I would like to find out more about this. That's God working on your heart. He's drawing you to himself. And he's saying, what I want is for you to understand I am God Almighty. Find somebody that has a testimony that you can talk to. Do you want it? Are you available to him? Who's the person in your life you know will never become a Christian. <laughs> Don't be surprised when they do. And Don't stop praying for them. Father in heaven, you have given to us the most wonderful treasure of the earth, yourself in ourselves. And here we are, listening to your word, singing your praises, secure in the knowledge we'll be going to heaven one day, not because of what we did, but for what you have done. And so we pray, most blessed God, we would be available. Our eyes and ears would be open to those who just ask the question, what about this Christ? Can you tell me? Oh, God, help us to speak the right words to them. Tell them what happened in our life and point them to you in the scriptures and see what you can do wonderfully.
God help us all to do that in your name. This same man, Paul, 